Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. We welcome any visitor that might be visiting with us today. And you that's listening out in the radio listen audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during this hour coming up we can be an inspiration to you in the singing as well as the preaching of God's Word. And you in the radio listen audience, you'd do someone a favor if you'd get on your phone and call them and have them to tune in, especially a shut-in. And we'd appreciate that so very much. If you have your Bible today, you turn to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 14. A lot of people having birthdays and weddings during this time of the year. Somebody said the best way in the world to tell when a person is reaching middle age is when his broad mind and his narrow waistline changes places. I guess that's a pretty good way to tell. Turn to Leviticus chapter 14, tape today, cassette tape would be number 129. I'm speaking today on the subject Where's the oil? I'm going to find out where the oil is today, and I hope that will be a blessing to you. I appreciate our listening audience. I want you to remember us in your prayers, and don't forget to write to us. We appreciate it so very much. Someone asked me today, be doing before Sunday school, one of the ladies said, Preach Edwards, who built this beautiful pulpit stand? Well, it is very unique and very beautiful. And it was built more than a quarter of a century ago by Brother Eunice Tate. Brother Eunice Tate is now gone on to be with the Lord. And he took much pains and put forth much effort in building the, this beautiful pulpit stand. I have a lot of people to make mention of it. It's very unique. I wouldn't trade it for any you could buy today. I really wouldn't. I appreciate it for the fact it was built by this dear man that loved God, was a member here many years ago who is now in heaven. I was just looking through my Bible. I'm doing this while you find your place in the Scriptures, Levit Leviticus chapter 14. I run across something here that says about the Tate family. Now, this has no connection with Brother Eunice Tate. I don't want you to think so. This is just something that's written by a Tate family I want to pass on to you. It says, do you know the Tate family? If you go to church, you probably do. There's a Tate family in every church. There's old man Dick Tate who wants to run the church. There's Uncle Rotate who tries to change everything. There's old sister Agitate stirs up trouble wherever possible and gets plenty of help from her brother Irritate. And when new projects are suggested, brother Hesitate is never quite sure. And sister Vegetate wants to wait till next year. Sister Imitate would have the church uh, mimic other churches. Uh, Sister Devitate proves that provides the voice of the doom. And O Potentate plays the big shot. There are fortunately two sides to every coin and to every family. There's Brother Facilitate, is quite helpful in church matters. And a delightful, happy, and cooperative member of the family is Miss Fel Felicitate. Finally, perhaps the most thoughtful member of Cogitate and his twin brother Meditate, who always thinks things over and lends a steady hand. Do you know the Tates? And this are written by Dr. John Tate, a retired minister of the United Methodist Church. So I thought you might want to meet the Tate family. We have them all here this morning, I'm sure. And we welcome every one of them. And may the good Lord bless you. Now, Leviticus chapter 14. I began reading with verse 14. It's page 144. Page 144. Where's the oil? Last Sunday we asked the question, where's the salt? Sunday before that we asked, where's the beef? And today we want to find out where the oil is. Oil is something very important. And so in Leviticus chapter 14, beginning with verse 14... And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering 
And the preacher put it upon the tip of his right ear, of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. And the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand. And the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil, that is, in his left hand, and shall sprinkle of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. Now the rest of the oil that is in his hand shall the priest put up on the tip of his right ear of him that is to be cleansed. Now upon the thumb of his right hand, now upon the great toe of his right foot, upon the blood of the trespass offering. And the rim of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall pour upon the head of him that is to be cleansed. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord. Now if you notice in verse 17, now you need to remember oil in the Bible is one of the strongest symbols of the Holy Spirit that you'll find in the Word of God. Now today as we talk about the oil, where is the oil? When we refer to oil, I want you to apply that to your own heart and life and instead of thinking about the oil as such, think about the Holy Spirit because oil is a beautiful symbol of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. In verse 17, And the rest of the oil that is in his hand shall the priest put up on the tip of his right ear of him that is to be cleansed. Now why put the oil on his right ear? Now, air in the Bible is symbolic of hearing, you know that. And that means faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And God wants us to hear what the preacher has to say and what he gives you from the word of God. It's to be put up on the tip of his right ear and up on the thumb of his right hand. Now, the hand is symbolic of working for God, serving God. And the oil is to be on his right hand. Now upon the great toe of his right foot. Now the foot there, of course, speaks of walking for God. Not only should you hear, but you should uh, walk for God and work for God as a Christian. You'll never amount to anything for God until you hear what God has to say from the Bible and be willing to be used of God in service for the Lord. If you don't do that, not willing to do that, then your efforts are in vain. Now, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 33, you don't need to turn there. There you find Jacob giving orders for the blessings of his uh, tribe, the 12 tribes of Israel, his 12 sons. And when it comes to the tribe Asher, his son Asher, he said, Asher shall dip his foot in oil. Now, that has great significance. It did have to the children of Israel because... When they went in and settled the land, the promised land and the land of Canaan, Asher was settled in an area where they had many olive trees. And I've traveled there many times, and even today, on the spot where Asher and his descendants were settled as one of the 12 tribes of Israel, there's a huge number of olive trees. Now they obtained their oil from olive trees, from olives in those days. And so even today, that particular era has many, many beautiful, beautiful olive trees. And that was the fulfillment of the promise of Jacob to his descendants and especially to Asher and his tribe. Now number one, in the Bible, oil was used for food. Now, even today, we have to have oil, we use oil. Food without oil many times is tasteless, and you couldn't very well fry food many times without some form of oil. Oil is so valuable in the means of uh, greasing uh, automobiles and other means of transportations and squeaky doors and things of that type. You find oil today to be very, very valuable. The Bible has a lot to say about it. One of the most troubled areas in the world today are having trouble over there in the countries where they supply much of the oil for the world. And that maybe oil may be one of the main things that lead us into a great conflict. I hope not. But oil is very valuable. The entire world today depends largely upon oil for almost every means of, 
of activity or transportation or whatnot. That's why so much trouble about the problem in the Middle East between Iran and Iraq is because of the oil situation in Arabia over there where they produce so much oil because our leaders know without oil we are paralyzed. And so we must have the oil. Now a child of God absolutely cannot operate without oil. You got to have the oil of God's spirit. And oil was used for food in Bible days. In Exodus chapter 29 verse 2, and unleavened bread and cakes and unleavened temper with oil and wafers and unleavened anointed with oil of wheat, of wheat and flour shall thou make them. They used this oil, olive oil, in, for their cooking in those days. Even when they went out and received manna from heaven, when God sent angel food down to the earth from heaven, and the Israelites went out and gathered that angel food they called manna, little small wafers, even that had a taste of oil in it. That shows you the significance of oil in those days. Numbers chapter 11, verses 7 and 8, and the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof as the color of, of uh, delium, and the people went about and gathered it and ground it in meals of uh, bits in mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as a taste of fresh oil. Oil is always important in the word of God, in the activity of the Lord. Where's the oil today? That's a trouble with our churches. We've absolutely eliminated the oil out of our churches today. And when I say that, I'm, th I'm, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, of course, today. Amen. And that's why we're not getting very far in our service for God, because much of the oil has been eliminated. We find in uh, the book of 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 12 and 13, a woman there had just a little oil and just a little meal. It was during the days of the droughts, during the days of Elijah, and there had been a drought in the land for many years. And she had eaten up everything in the house except a little meal and a little oil. Now, of course, she had mixed the oil with the meal and baked the bread. The old man of God appeared on the scene and said to her, said, uh, I want you to uh, give me something to eat. What do you have there in your house? She said, I have just a little oil, that's all, and just a little meal. And I'm out here gathering a couple of sticks now. I'm going in and cook the last little old whole cake we have and my son and I is going to eat it and then we're going to lay down and die because we don't have anything else to eat. What did the man of God tell the woman? The man of God, Elijah, said, I want you to go in and bake me a cake first. Now, he did not say that because he was selfish. He said that because that involves a principle. He said, you go and bake me a little cake first. And after you bake me a little cake first, then you go ahead and bake you one and your son one. And sit down and eat all you please. The woman believed the man of God and she went in and baked the man of God a cake. Brought it out to him. And, and then she went in and she cooked her a cake and her son a cake. And every time she'd pour in some more on a little meal and go back for some more, it would be there. And that woman was supplied with oil and meal until the end of the drought. Now she had to have that to survive. And so by honoring the man of God first. Now that's why Elijah said, bake me a cake first. Now he would have been glad to have waited and eaten last. I'm sure he was a great honorable man of God, but this principle involved. Now that tells us this. That we are to honor God first. Put God first. And then God will take care of us. And that we need to do. That principle runs all the way through the Bible. Many of us put God last or somewhere along the way and we come in first. But that's not the way it should be. Where is the oil in your life? Are you putting God first? If you're putting God first in all of your activity for God, then God can supply that oil and that meal to take care of you as you sojourn. But if you don't bake the prophet a cake first, then don't be surprised if you don't have any for yourself. Number two, oil was used as cosmetics for anointing the body after bath. Now those beautiful women in those days, after they'd take their bath, they would anoint their body with oil. Probably some of the men did likewise, but used for cosmetic also in those days. 
In Psalms 104 and verse 15, the Bible says, And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine. The reason some of those women had such beautiful skin and still have in the Middle East, beautiful smooth skin, is because they use much oil, olive oil, on their bodies. And they've done that for years. And it's made their faces beautiful and smooth. And therefore they still use it in those days. Now God is concerned about our bodies. Now many of us treat our bodies just most any way without any regard to the body being the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now before you got saved, your body belonged to you. But after you got saved, your body belongs to God. And you take care of your body for Jesus' sake. That's the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, What know you are not, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which is God. So you need to consider that body not just a house in, where, in which you live and dwell, but you need to consider your body as a temple where God lives. That's why God wants you to take care of your body. Don't abuse your body. Don't take things into your body that will tear down and destroy and weaken your body. Because your body belongs to God. And the better you take care of it. And of, the, of course the temple, the vessel of God should be clean. Keep your body cleaned up the best you can and look the best you can and do it for the glory of God and, and try to keep yourself in as good a health as possible and do it for Jesus' sake. That's a temple. That's why God is living. It grieves the Spirit of God for people to abuse their bodies, mistreat their bodies, do things to damage their bodies and to tear down their bodies. That's not a good testimony. God wants you to take care of that body. That's why it's wrong and sinful to cremate a body at death. The Bible tells you the bodies go back to dust, not to ashes. And to cremate a body at death means you dishonor the temple of the Holy Ghost. No Christian should even think about cremating your body at death. That's wrong. In the Bible, the old prophets of God always found a burying place. And there they buried their dead. That's where it should be, the Cremation comes from heathenism. They practiced that in Japan, which many years ago was strictly a heathen nation. And much of it is today, and they still practice that in that land. And they cremate the body, which is wrong for a Christian to do. When it comes to a sinner, since they don't know God anyway, I don't guess it makes too much difference. But I'm talking about a Christian. See, a Christian's body belongs to God. God doesn't want you to dishonor that body in any respect even in life or death. And you need to keep that in mind. Read your Bible all the way through where people died. The bodies were honored. That is for people that knew God. Now some of them those warfares and things like that and fighting the heathen, it was a different matter. Where's the oil today? How many of you people are looking out after your body? You need to look the best you can to the glory of God. Kind of keep yourself fixed up, neat and clean, looking the best you can. You ought to do it for several reasons. You ought to do it, number one, for God's sake, because your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. You ought to do it for your husband's sake and for your wife's sake and for your family's sake. Keep yourself looking the best you can. Most of us, as we grow older, we have to be more careful to keep the old barn fixed up a little bit because you take an old barn about to fall down and you can kind of patch it up and paint it and you've got a pretty good looking old barn out there. Thing might be a hundred years old, but it looks better. And as we grow older, and as I said earlier, you know, when the broad mind and the narrow waist begins to trade places, then you need to work a little hard on the old body and keep it looking better. That wife of yours has to look across the table at you about two, three times a day, and it do well to kind of keep the old tabernacle looking pretty good. And you wives, your husband has to look at you two or three times a day across the table and in and out of the house. And it's, it's wise on your part to try to keep that body beautiful and looking good and neat and dressed up as much as possible for even for his sake and for the family's sake. A lot of people, when they get married, they don't care how they look anymore. 
They don't care. Some people, men go for weeks and never shave, never get a haircut, and wives never try to fix themselves up, and, and they don't care how they look. They, well, I got married, got me a husband, got me a wife. I don't care anymore. That's the wrong attitude. First for Jesus' sake and then for the family's sake. Where's the oil? Number three, oil was used as a medicine. Back in those days, you'd be surprised at how much uh, they used that oil for medication. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 34, the Bible said he went to him and bound up his wounds, put an oil and wine, set him on his own beast, brought him to an inn and took care of him. Here you find the good Samaritan picking up a fallen man in the gutter. He had been wounded and bleeding and robbed and, and so he took him and he put some oil in those wounds. Now the good shepherd over in the Middle East today out watching his sheep, he carries with him a little bottle of oil. And whenever a sheep gets a scratch on it, he'll put a little oil on it because that has a healing application. And oil is used for healing. That's in James chapter 5 and verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. That's why the Bible speaks about uh, calling the elders of the church and putting a little oil on the sick person. Nothing wrong in that. A lot of people today in the... Uh, uh, Pentecostal movement, you know, have muddied the water in that respect, but it's still good to use oil if you want to. Use the oil, anoint people with oil. And oil, the Bible, in the Bible, is symbolic of medicine. And so if God wants us to, of course, uh, use the right kind of medication. Now, oil is healthy for you. So is the Holy Spirit. The person is filled with the Holy Ghost as a general rule, pretty much is a healthy person. The Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. If you stay filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to have a merry heart and you'll be far better off health-wise than you would be otherwise. So you keep that in mind. You got a lot of racketeers in the field today. A lady wrote me last week. I felt sorry for the poor lady. An old fellow, a racketeer by the name of Urban out of Atlanta, I think maybe some California, sending out uh, nightcaps and sending out fingernail files and sending out uh, scraps of clothes and sending out everything he can to uh, telling the people if they would put those nightcaps on and sleep in them, they would be prosperous. And then the last letter he sent, he said, if you go borrow money, $20, $50, $100, and send it to me, you get a, if you borrow $20, you get a $20 blessing. If you borrow $50, you get a $50 blessing. If you borrow $100 and send it to him, you get a $100 blessing. This poor woman sent me the letter and wrote me and asked me what I thought about it. I wrote back and told her, it's nothing but a racketeer and a crook. I write to him and tell him, quit sending that junk, there's nothing to it. You got a lot of these crooks today that take advantage of poor people that don't know any better and send all that kind of junk out and claim if you'll use it for healing or use it for prosperity. If you'll do this or do that, then you're going to prosper and there's a great blessing out there and you're going to get that $100 blessing or that $500 blessing. All that is satanic to the core. This old man, Urban, hell is going to be hot for that jaybird when he draws his last breath on the earth. Deceiving poor people in that respect. Now, number four, oil was used for anointing of kings and priests. When time came for them to anoint kings and priests, they used oil. In Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 12, he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. That's symbolic of being anointed by the Spirit. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. David, as a little lad, was anointed to be king of Israel. That's a type of the Spirit anointing you for service. In Psalms chapter 23 and verse 5, the psalmist said, Thou preparest a table before him to press my enemies, I anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Psalms chapter 45 and verse 7, Thy God hath anointed thee with oil of gladness above thy fellows. The anointing with oil is a type of being filled with the Spirit. Where's the oil? We need more of God's oil today of the Holy Spirit to be anointed. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27, the anointing that abideth in you teaches you all things. 
And the reason many people are so ignorant pertaining to the doctrines of God is they don't have the anointing of God's Spirit dwelling in them as they should or taking, over, taking them over under His control as being filled with God's Spirit. Amen. Now we need the oil today, the anointing of God. Where is the oil? We need it today. That's why some of our church is screeching and making a lot of noise and not running smoothly because without a good greasing, the old wagon wheels will screech, you know. And so we need the oil of God's Spirit. And when we have the good anointing oil, things run along smoothly to the glory of God. When church members begin to screech and carry on, you better get some more oil because the oil is running low. Need a good greasing of the oil of God. Number five, oil was used in offerings. When they'd make the offerings of meal and different things, they always use oil. Now the Holy Ghost of God would like to anoint us in our offering of ourselves, number one, and our means, number two. And so he blesses us when we come to the place when we realize what we do, we do it to the glory of God. Old man Jacob, when he was leaving home, Went out into the desert there, lay down to sleep, and he dreamed he saw a ladder reaching all the way to heaven. And he dreamed he saw the Son of Man standing at the end of that ladder. And he saw the angels there on the ladder. And he woke up, he said, surely, surely this must be, God must be in this place. And in Genesis chapter 35, verses 14 and 15, Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him. Even a pillow of stone, he poured drink offerings thereon, he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. Jacob said, God is here. God has met with me here. And I'm going to call this the house of God. And he put a stone out there. And then he anointed that stone with oil. And he called it Bethel. Amen. And he said, Lord, the tenth of everything you give me from here on in or be yours, one-tenth of it. This is the house of God. He made that vow to God. And God blessed him. And God used him. But he anointed the spot with oil. We need to recognize the Holy Spirit in the matter of our giving ourselves and giving our means. Oil was used to pay a widow woman's debt and keep her sons out of the hands of the of a adversary in 2 Kings chapter 4. Customary in olden times, if somebody owed a debt and couldn't pay it, then they could come and take their children in as bondage, and they would go in to be slaves for a period of time. This poor old woman only had two sons. Her husband was a preacher, and he had died, and she was left behind with nothing, just two boys, and they owed some money, and they couldn't pay their debts. And the men of God, Elisha, came on the scene, and and she told him about, about what had happened and said, they're about to take my boys as a slaves and they're all I have and I don't have any money and I just can't pay my debts. Now every born again Christian is concerned about his debts. If you're a debt, then it's only right that you pay it. If you don't pay it, you've lied to your debtor and your thief and you've stolen, you've taken that which don't belong to you. If you're dishonest in your debts, you're, most, most to pay, you're supposed to pay your debts. And if you get into tight finance and can't pay on time, go to your debtor, sit down and talk with him. And if he's any kind of a man at all, he'll bear with you because he's got sense enough to know it's better to wait and get a little at a time and get it later than not get it at all. But have an understanding of your debtor. The Bible said, oh, no man, anything. Christian people need to be very careful about running into debts that they can't pay and bring a reproach on the cause of Christ and short circuit the power of God in their lives and keeping God's blessings away from their homes. Always pay your debts. If you can't have a good understanding about it, let nobody say, there goes a man that says he's a Christian and he won't pay his debts. That's a terrible reflection. Might as well say, there goes a drunkard. There goes a gambler. There goes the man that says the Christian, thus and thus, because dishonesty in your debts is just as sinful as what are you getting drunk. And so you need to realize that. And she wanted to pay her debts. And the man of God said, you go out here and bring some containers in. Bring in all you can get. And they went out and brought them in. And he prayed to God. And God began to fill those containers 
and filled every one of them until they filled the last one that brought in. Had they brought in more, that had more oil in the house, but they stopped at a certain number. And they took that oil, number one, they went out and paid their debts. Then number two, they lived on the rest of it as long as the famine was in the land. Where's the oil today? Are you paying up? Are you paying up to God? Are you paying up to your fellow man? Now oil is used, of course, to help us. The Holy Spirit helps us to be willing to pay our debts. Then we come to number six, and oil gives light. Now today we're living in the days of electric power. We don't worry like people did in biblical days when they used the little candles and the oil containers. Several years ago, I mean a couple of years ago, when uh, the land uh, in, in Samaria, I believe, I bought a little oil lamp that came out of Egypt and was made 7 A.D., 700 years after Christ, that little oil lamp was made. And I purchased it, brought it home, just a little one, you put oil in it, set it on fire, and then that kept a light in your home. But anyway, they used a the little oil lamps. Now, when I was a boy growing up out in the country, we did not have the electric power into our homes, and my mother used an oil lamp. And you old timers know what that's all about. You put the oil in the lamp, you have the wick in there, and then you set it on fire and you put the globe on it, and it gives you light in the house. Now you know how that's done, and that hasn't been a million years ago when we had to use that method. Oil gives light. When you come to Matthew chapter 25, you find in the first 13 verses five foolish virgins and five wise. The five wise had some oil with their lamps, and the five foolish had no oil with their lamps, and they were left out. Where's the oil? Do you have oil today with your lamps? A lamp in the Bible is symbolic of the Word of God. The, whole, the oil is a symbol of the Spirit. Do you have the Holy Ghost and your Bible? Or do you just have your Bible and don't have the Holy Spirit? You need them both. Number seven, oil was used to anoint for gladness. In the Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9, Thy love and righteousness hath hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. The reason some Christians are much happier than others is because they're more filled with the Spirit. They have more oil. Where's your oil? You see somebody sitting around looking sour like they're drinking a half gallon of vinegar and they eat a few dill pickles and bit down on a few green persimmons. You know it, they're at a low ebb, spiritually, the oil is about run out. Now we need the oil of gladness and let the world know we have something that makes us glad that they don't have. Then finally, oil was used for anointing for burial. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 46, My head with oil thou didst not anoint, said Jesus, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. And then he said about her in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 12, For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Beloved, oil is used to anoint bodies for burial was in those days. And I hope that you have the anointing oil. Where is the oil today? We need the oil of God to run smoothly to the glory of God. Dr. George W. Truitt, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas for 40 years. What a man to God. That man is 64 years old. And Dr. Truitt looked back there and saw a big smile on his face. And that man is so happy. And Dr. Tripp was so thrilled, he'd won that 64-year-old man to God. And he couldn't hardly wait till next Sunday to see the man come into the church. He seemed to be so happy. He looked over the audience, he spotted him back there, but instead of being happy, he had his head down and looked terribly sad. Dr. Tripp went to him after service and said, Dear brother, last Sunday you were so happy because you'd gotten saved, and I want to see you happy today. He said, What's the trouble? He said, Sir, I'm saved. I was happy last Sunday, but said, what's bothering me? So I let my poor wife die, and I don't know whether she died without God or not. And said, not only that, I have two sons. So I went to talk to my two sons, and they said, Daddy, we live our own lives, and, and you will live 64 years without God, and if we want to do that, that would be our business. He said, that broke my heart. Then he said, I went to my grandson, and I said, grandson, your granddad is saved, and I love the Lord, and I want you to get saved, son. The young boy looked at his dad and winked and said, Grandpa, when I get 64, so I'll get saved too. He said, Dr. Truett, that's exactly why I'm sad today. 
Beloved, we need to realize now is the time to get the oil and do all we can to get our loved ones in, not wait till we're dead with old age because they'll look at you then and think you're crazy like Lot's son-in-laws did in Sodom and Gomorrah when he went out and tried to get them out of those wicked places. So you need to get them to God while you're young and while you're young, you need all of God's spirit to help you as you sojourn. Thank you, you've listened well. Let's stand to our feet. Father in heaven, we need more of the good oil of the Holy Spirit today. And I pray that you'll anoint us afresh anew. May the Spirit of God operate in our hearts and lives. I pray you'll take this message and use it. Reach somebody in the radio listening audience. I pray you'll reach somebody in this building today. And may Jesus be honored, I pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. Now, Debbie's playing for us as she plays. I don't know whether God spoke to you or not. You and you alone know that. But if God spoke to you and impressed you to come down here for any reason, to get saved, come back to God, or join the church, a rededication, or whatever, you come while she plays. I'll meet you here. I'll help you in any way I can. Would you come? speaking today while she plays just another moment would you come 